gave the wine? Yeshua. But who did the governor think gave the wine? Who does the bridegroom represent in this particular parable? Israel. The bridegroom represents Israel under Moshe. Follow it. And everybody in Israel knows that what is good is given first. The Torah was given on Mount Sinai to the people of Israel first. It wasn't given to the Goyim. It wasn't given to the Gentiles. It wasn't given to the nations of the world. And if you look at Exodus chapter 16, verse 9, it's very clear the Father's intention of giving the Torah to Israel first is because the entire nation of Israel was supposed to be a kingdom of priests. You'll hear this from the last time I was here. Now, an entire nation of priests, obviously their duty isn't to minister to each other. Now, think about that, do we? Now, first of all, according to the, the Parsha today, Aaron was given to minister to who? Not to Israel, before the Lord. God separated him out and called him and his lineage forever out to minister to the Lord. Amen? So Israel's job as a nation was first of all to minister to the Lord, but then to minister the Lord's words to the nations. Why? So that the nations would look like they do. But here's something interesting. In all of Jewish thinking, the Jewish thinking says, God gave the good to us first. What happened just previous to this? And we read it. And you're going to understand why I read it. John the Immerser was down in the RD in the Jordan, baptizing who? Was he baptizing Goyim? No. Did John the Immerser have authority to baptize Jews? From who? Interesting, huh? Do you know the only reason Jews baptize people? Change in what? To become a Jew. Baptism, immersion, always represents and a change in later life. If you're in the Jewish culture and you're already a Jew, it always can represent a change. But in the process of converting to Judaism, the, the one of the number one signs was baptism. It was showing that you are giving away your people. Matter of fact, the book of Ruth. How many of you know Ruth? You know, when, when her mother-in-law was about to go home, she said, hey, just go back to your own people. She said, no. Where you go, I'll go. Your people are not going to be my people. The interesting thing is, they had to cross over. Oh, I got to start preaching today. <laughs> they had to cross over. I see why Rabbi puts this over here now. <laughs> they had to cross over the what river? The Euphrates first. Yes, they crossed the Jordan, but they had to cross the Euphrates first. Who else crossed the Euphrates River back time past? Avram. And when Avram, Abraham, when he crossed over that Euphrates River, we call it the process in the Hebrew, Aber, E-B-E-R, right? Aber. What does Aber mean? To cross over. It also is where we get our common uh, word for Jew. That's where the word Jew is actually means. It means to cross over. We see Ruth baptized, if you will, crossing over the Euphrates River. She's converting to Judaism. She's converting to be in the nation of Israel. She's leaving her ways behind. She's coming in to be a part of this nation. John the Immerser is down there baptizing not Gentiles, not the nations of the world. He is baptizing Jews. Now you can understand why the priests and the Levites have got a problem with this. Why are you baptizing Jews? What are they converting to? I'm telling you, mark my words. I come today, I want to tell you something by the Spirit of the Lord. People are going to start asking this congregation, what is the matter with you? With what authority do you do what you're doing? Why are you doing what you're doing? And I'm telling you, you must be ready to declare, all of us, we are doing what we do because we have heard from the Father and through the Holy Spirit and we are being obedient to what He is telling us to do with the leadership of Rabbi and Sister Deborah. Are you with me? 
This ain't the time to sit quiet today. I want to encourage us. Amen? This is an amazing time in Scripture. John the Baptist is down there baptizing people. He's baptizing them from the good, the first. Everyone in Israel always gives the good wine first. And then that which is less quality when everybody is familiar with the traditions. Yes, sir. In the Jordan, you mean? Good question, isn't it? <laughs> but look at Jesus' response in the book of Luke. He says, let all things be fulfilled. Let all things fulfill righteousness. So John was clearly saying, I don't have right to baptize you. But Jesus was coming as an Israelite, as a Jew, into that, into that Jordan to be baptized into the same system. I really believe that. Amen? That's a good question for Rabbi. It's true. It's by example. That's right. That's right. We got to know it before we can preach it. Amen. That's a very good question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some study on that. <laughs> good question. I'll tell you this right off. I don't have it all. I don't even have a little bit. <laughs> but I, I'm just honored to be a teacher, you know, a servant. Amen. But are you getting the picture here? We're at this wedding feast. And the governors just told the bridegroom, you know what? Everybody always gives the good first. And then when everybody's drunk and freely, he always gives that which is less. He said, but you, you now have given the okay first and you've kept the best for last. Now, life under the Torah was what? Good. And if you were in the nation of Israel, can you imagine a light burning in the heavens as far as you can see over the, over the temple? Can you imagine seeing that temple with the fiery presence of the Lord? The, the Shekinah? Shekinah. She, Shekinah. Shekinah. We always say Shekinah. But <laughs> oh, I'm learning too. I would have learned the phraseology. But nonetheless, can you imagine seeing that glowing over that place? And then during the day, the beautiful clouds. Can it get any better than that? How many of us would like to see just an angel? Yeah. <laughs> Come on, God, just an angel or something, man. I, I, <laughs> but you did. I did. And it was for this body. Yeah, as long as it's like, yeah. <laughs> I've been knocked off of that too. <laughs> and it's for my good, amen. But I tell you, we long to see the supernatural, don't we? Yeah. Then why don't we? If that was just the good, and life under the Messiah is the best, what are we waiting for? Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amen? What are we waiting for? Now, isn't it interesting? We always get caught up in church, the homiletical, theological, philosophical, and hermeneutical. We all talk this, this really ingenious, oh, I'm, I'm educated. Well, he didn't make alcoholic wine, and bless God. And we get into this conversation about wine. And why would Jesus, and then he thinks, uh, well, you see, brother, Jesus made wine, it's okay to drink it, the Lord made wine. That's a non-Jew trying to interpret a parable that's trying to show Jews who? the Messiah. Amen. It's tied right in with Jesus coming on the scene and John the Immerser looking and acknowledging him. You are the Son of God. You are God's Lamb. This is all tied in together. That's why you need to read both of those portions together. If you just read John Immerser, people, it doesn't make sense. And if you just read the first miraculous sign that Jesus gave, turning the water into wine, it doesn't make sense. But you read the two together and you start to realize Jesus turned that water into wine not for us Gentiles. He turned the water into wine to show His disciples, His Jewish disciples, that He was the Messiah. He was doing nothing more than reiterating. He was confirming the word that John the Immerser gave. And what did John the Immerser say when he saw Yeshua? Lamb of God, right? He said, I must do what? And he must... John the Immerser was under the good. 
But now all of a sudden, we're going to shake up the nation a little bit and we're going to show the best. Amen? Amen. Now, in my Bible, I like to have a blue highlighter. And every time I see something about feasts, you know, there's seven ordained feasts in the calendar. And then there's many, many others that are in traditions and cultures and all this kind of stuff. But every time I see something related to the feast times, I like to highlight it blue because it's just, I don't know, it's just me. If blue looks good for, hey, feast, this is important. Calendar, think calendar. But I want you to look down here at verse uh, 13. That's my one problem with the complete Jewish Bible. It's in like 10 font. I need binoculars. To... <laughs> Does anybody else have that problem? <laughs> Amen. Chapter 2, verse 13. It was almost time for the festival of Pesach. How do you say Is that how you say it? Pesach. Which is Passover. Isn't it interesting that today in the Parsha, we see that this is talking about the priestly garments of the high priest and when he was going in to worship, to, to minister before the Lord, right? During this parsha, we know next week is what? Or it's actually starting Monday. Is Purim. <laughs> it's when we, we celebrate Esther, the book of Esther, right? What do we do? And I heard a little funny about you. We dress in costumes, don't we? Why do we all dress in costumes? Does anybody know? Do what? Sure, sure. <laughs> Amen. Does anybody know the traditional reason why we wear masks and costumes? Interesting. Do you know in the book of Esther, God's name is never mentioned one time? Is there any doubt in the book of Esther that God is in charge of this stuff? In the, in the culture, in the traditions, God's name is not mentioned. He's veiled. So as part of understanding and part of the Jewish culture to help us remember that God is behind the scenes even though we can't see Him or hear Him mentioned, we dress in costumes to show that even though God is not mentioned in the book of Esther, even though His name is not mentioned one time, He is still yet behind the scenes saving His people Israel from who? From the devil, from the enemy, but specifically who? Oh, that's an annihilation. From annihilation, that's exactly right. But one particular person who we're going to eat his ears. Haman. Haman, right? Who was Haman? An Agai guy. An Agai guy. <laughs> I'm sorry? That's it. He was a cat out to get him, wasn't he? I want you to understand something. Haman, we'll use the English phraseology today. <laughs> Not phraseology, but you know. Haman, I guess is, I think, how you actually say it. He was an Amalekite. Now, if you'll turn in your Bibles with me to Exodus. Go back to Exodus, if you will. You're like, Pastor, you're all over the place. No, I'm, I promise you, we're gonna, you're going to see some... You're going to see some stuff. You're going to see it. I promise. I want you to look at Exodus chapter 17. Now, I, I, I apologize. I forgot to write down his name to give him credit. But uh, I was looking on the, the website, Aish.com, and one of the rabbis for this particular parsha, parsha, I guess I can say it, um, one of the particular rabbis was saying that one of, the, one of the things that go along with this is that every parsha previous to Purim, we also mention Amalek. And we mention Amalek because of the ancestry, the descendant, the lineage, if you will, of where Haman comes from. Haman is an Amalekite. And it backs all the way back up to Amalek. And therefore, it's a good, it's a good idea if we associate this before we enter into this next week. And I know you've got a play and all kinds of neat things prepared. And even next Shabbat, it's, 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 it's just an interesting time of year. Amen? It's a wonderful time of year to celebrate. But I want to just set the stage for what's going to happen to us this next week. In the, in the Parsha and the different readings. Amen? So if you look at verse, chapter 17, verse 1, it says, The whole community of the people of Israel did what? Left. Left. Does anybody remember my sermon title? 
I didn't give it too clear, did I? What was one of the first concepts I gave you this morning or this afternoon? New beginnings, right? And doing what in the desert? Making the paths straight. How many of you feel like you're in a desert? How many of you feel like that life's kind of a wilderness at the moment? How many feel like this congregation has been kind of in a wilderness at the moment? In different things. Not, not all of it, but it's kind of been in a wilderness. I want you to see this. The whole community of people of Israel left the seen desert. I want to speak prophetically to you today. You are getting ready to step out of the desert. The only way to step out of the desert is to make your paths straight in the desert. Hello? Not just role playing. Not just having a form of godliness. But I mean having the righteousness that is in Yeshua Messiah. Amen. Having that righteousness that is in Him. In other words, not having the old wine. Not having the good wine first. But we're going to rock the apple cart here. It has nothing to do with the wine and the making of the wine. It has everything to do with the concept of now we're going to bring out the best. And who was it given to? The Gentiles, it's not, it has nothing to do with Gentiles. It has everything to do with the nation of Israel under the new leadership of Yeshua Messiah. Amen? Amen. So, verse 1. The whole community of people of Israel left the sea desert, traveling in stages. Brother, this, this is exactly what you talked about last week. I like the stages stuff. I mean, man, this is good stuff. <clears throat> as Adonai, as Yahweh actually, as Yahweh had ordered, and they camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moshe, demanding, give us water to drink. But Moshe replied, why do you pick a fight with me? Why are you testing Yahweh? However, the people were thirsty for water there and grumbled against Moshe. For what did you bring us up out of Egypt for, Moses? <laughs> to kill us, our children, our livestock with thirst? Now come on. How many days in the desert are we? Not very many. <laughs> They're down there grumbling and complaining because they don't have anything to drink. Did they forget that Yahweh just parted the entire Reed Sea with a man's staff? Can you imagine that? I can understand if it had been a couple of years. Some of us tend to forget things after a few years. And my wife and I, we always, we always giggle. Our, our anniversary is on <laughs> January 2nd. Well, I can't tell you if, how, many, how many times now, honey, have we missed it? Three or four. I think three or four. You just go along and you're in the holidays and everything and you get past the New Year's and then it's like, oh yeah, our anniversary was yesterday. <laughs> After the year goes by, you tend sometimes to forget. But these folks weren't out of Egypt a year yet. I think, I think in actuality, a couple months, three months, I think. Three months. Yes, sir. I've always wondered why they didn't they knew that rock was following uh, what was that rock following you for? Yeah. Why? Why wouldn't we ask that question? <laughs> Who was the rock? Christ. Yeah, sure, that's right. He was the rock following in the wilderness. Amen? Amen? But here we see grumbling and complaining. <laughs> Why did you bring us out of Egypt? To kill us all with thirst? Look at verse 4. Moses cried out to Yahweh, What am I to do with these people? They're all ready to stone me. And Yahweh answered Moshe, Go on ahead of the people and bring with you the what? God does everything first in leaders. God's not going to do anything with his congregation until he does it with Rabbi. He does it with Deborah. And I tell you, it's no coincidence. Have you heard what Miss Deborah said about the, the, the tumor that was in her body? What it was, what it was symbolic of? Did anybody, was that in the email? I don't know if it was or not. We said it in prayer that morning over there. <laughs> that she felt like it was symbolic of the cancerous religious spirit that's in East Texas right now. And this, re this cancerous tumor being taken out of her body is the same thing that's going to happen to the body of Yeshua in this East Texas region so that East Texas can start seeing the pure, unadulterated gospel of the living God. Not this religion. Now, I'm telling you, it seems like a horrible thing for Miss Deborah to have to go through the situation she's in right now. And we've all prayed and asked God to touch her in her body. But think about it. What if Yeshua had this happen for a sign and for a testament of what God is getting ready to do in the unseen? 
He's taken the leaders of this congregation through this situation to cut out the cancerous tumor. And look what's going to... Ah, does anybody feel Holy Ghost in this place but me? My goodness. Look what you as a body are going to get ready to do with your leadership. You're going to infect East Texas with the purity, with the holiness that is in Yeshua Messiah. You guys are getting ready to step into some of the words, some of the visions that Rabbi has received for this body. Amen? Yes. But I want to show you something interesting in this reading. I'll finish with this this morning, this afternoon. i got this morning on the brain. Something always happens when the new season is revealed. It's a time of new beginnings. I didn't walk on that sidewalk today in a figure eight for nothing. <laughs> really. I would never walk that way on that sidewalk, by the way. I'm, I'm just kind of a symmetrical kind of guy. I like to walk straight lines. You know, I don't like all that figure eight stuff. You know, it's too much work. <laughs> but I believe when God had me walk on that this morning, He showed me new beginnings for this congregation and new beginnings for the body of Yeshua Messiah in this entire region of East Texas. But I'm telling you, there's a spark of it that's going to happen right here. Amen? And if there's ever been a time for you to bolster what you believe and to get close to Rabbi and his wife and, and, and Nathaniel and to get close to the words that he's been given and start asking him for resources of what God is showing him for this congregation and for the entire East Texas, it's now. Amen? It's time right now. Let's keep reading. Verse, uh, I look at verse 5 again. Yahweh said to Mo Moshe, Go on ahead of the people and bring your leaders with you. Or bring out the leaders of Israel. Take your staff in your hand and the one you use to strike the river, or the Reed Sea, and go. I will stand in front of the air, in front of you there. My brain's running faster than my mouth can. On the rock of Horeb, and you are to strike the rock. Water will come out of it so the people can drink. And Moshe did this in the sight of the leaders. I believe the doctor went in there as the hand of the Lord and struck that rock. To, I'm telling you, struck that tumor in Deborah's body. And it is a sign that God is getting ready to flow rivers of living water out of you as a congregation, out of her as an individual, out of every single one of you as individuals, out of every single one of us as the body of Yeshua Messiah. It's time. The Bible says in John chapter 7, verse 37, that rivers of living water will flow out of our bellies. That's a physical location that spiritual things are going to flow out of. Hello? It's not spiritual location. It's a physical location. In other words, when you walk into the marketplace, when you walk into your families, God doesn't want us role-playing with customs and traditions. God wants us moving in the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen? And I believe he has started this process himself by stretching out the doctors, the great physician's hand this week, and touching Sister Dever's body. Do it in front of the leaders. Verse 7. The place was named Masa, testing, and Mariva, quarreling, because of the quarreling of the who? People. Not the leaders, so huh? Where were the leaders? The leaders was where Moshe, seeing the supernatural signs of God being activated. So why? What would happen to the leaders because of that? They would believe. The same thing with the Tommy Dean. When they were there and Jesus turns that water into wine, what happened when they gave that water to the governor of the feast? It says in the end of that chapter, in the end of that part, that, that portion right there, it says, and his Tommy Dean <laughs> believed in him. What did they believe? They believed that he was the Messiah. Why was this important? You can't believe anything good that somebody give you until you believe in them first. Yes, they were. And I'm telling you, the testing's from the Lord anyway. Amen? Keep reading. It's coming. Everybody, you got a highlighter or a pen? What's the next word? Verse 8? What happens when we quarrel? What happens when we're complaining? God, circumstances just don't look good. I don't know what's going to happen with the congregation. Lord, things are kind of weird and we don't have a whole lot of financing and oh, all this stuff's happening to Rabbi and his wife. God, what are we going to do? I know none of us are saying that, but, you know, outsiders sometimes we all feel like that. You know what I'm saying? 
Amen. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moshe said to Yehoshua, Joshua, Choose men for us, go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the hill with God's staff in my hand. And Yehoshua did as Moshe had told him and fought with Amalek. Then Moshe, Aharon, Hur went up to the top of the hill. And when Moshe raised his hand, Israel prevailed. But when he let it down, Amalek prevailed. However, Moshe's hands grew heavy. So they took a stone, put it under him to sit on it. And Aharon and Hur held up his hands, the one on one side and the other on the other side, so that his hands stayed, my God Almighty, so that his hands stayed steady until the setting of the sun. Thus, Yehoshua defeated Amalek, putting their people to the sword. And Yahweh said to Moshe, Write this in a book to be remembered, and tell it to Yehoshua. I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moshe built an altar and called it Adonai Nisi. Adonai is my banner, miracle. And said, because their hand was against the throne of Yah. Who was Amalek fighting? We don't think that, do we? We think Amalek was fighting the nation of Israel, the Jews. Do you realize when you fight a believer... You're fighting the throne of God. When an unbeliever is being controlled by the enemy and they fight against you, they fight against this congregation, they fight against the body of Yeshua Messiah, do you realize God says they are fighting against my throne? 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16 says, Do you know not that you are the temple of the Do you know, while there was a temple standing in, in Israel, there were washings and, and mitzvah, all kinds of... Uh, that's not the right How do you say commandment? Yeah, mitzvah, yeah. Uh, all different kinds of things. But while that temple is gone, where does God live? In us. His throne literally is in the believers of Yeshua Messiah. Amen? Amen. So where can His glory cloud still be? On earth, in us. Know you not that rivers of living water shall flow out of your... Sounds like we've got some work to do, don't we? But look what happened to Moshe. He got tired, didn't he? Holding the hand up there like that with a rod, he got tired. Who actually won the battle? The angelic host. I don't know if you ever think about it. Joshua's down there in the, in, the, in the land with a couple real strong warriors. They're down there fighting with Amalek and his warriors. But the whole time Moshe had his rod up, his staff up in the air, the angels were fighting the demonic forces that were causing the enemy to win, and they were losing. But every time Moshe got tired and his hands fell down, it says the, angelic, the demonic forces that were bothering the enemy, they started prevailing against Israel. How many people got involved in that? One man had the power. One man had the power to evacuate the demonic forces around the enemy so that Joshua could do his job and win. And when that one man got tired, uh, Aharon and Hur, they stood there and they held up Moshe's hands so that he could continue the work. Do you realize, congregation, it is our job and our duty as the body of Messiah to hold up the hands and I'm telling you, when Rabbi and Sister Deborah, when they are in this kind of say, it's time for us to hold up the hands so that the battle can continue to be won. Amen? Now, yes, we're getting supernatural signs in the unseen because of what God's doing through her body right now. But I'm telling you, we must continue as a body and a congregation to continue to lift up those hands because I'm telling you, God is using Rabbi with that staff in his hand as a Moshe. And yes, he has told me one of the visions that God has given him, that he would stand as Moshe and, and, and put that staff down on the ground. And there would be hundreds of thousands of other Moshes all around the globe doing the same thing at the same time. We've got to quit quarreling with the body of Messiah. We've got to quit fighting about little ifs and ands and buts. We've got to come together under the banner, like it says there, that Adonai is my banner, he is my miracle. The only thing any of us have consistently together is the blood of Jesus Christ that has cleansed us from all sin. Yes. Amen? Amen? 
And it is time that we come together underneath that banner and start holding up the leader's hands. Holding up the hands of East Texas so that we can evacuate this, this demonic, this evil, cancerous religious spirit. Amen? Amen? Now, can I give you a little point before we leave? If you're taking notes, this is kind of interesting. Do you know that uh, most of the Tanakh has numerical value? That the rabbis, you know, every single letter has up to seven different meanings anyway? Yeah. And every word has up to 70 different meanings? My oh, Lord, I thought I, I, English ease was tough. The bonics was tough. And I'm telling you what, that many different possible interpretations, that's pretty tough, isn't it? The numerical value of the name Amalek is 240. And that numerical value is the same as the word Safek, S-A-F-E-K. Do you know what that is the Hebrew word for? Doubt. Israel is coming out of their bondage. Can I talk to you? <laughs> Israel is coming out of their bondage. Their captors have been destroyed. The bondage of sin has left them. God has, God has redeemed His holy people by His strong right arm. But on that process of going to their destiny, they have to fight with doubt. And this week, just in that parable, it said it was just previous to the Passover season. Amen? Amen? It's just previous to the Purim season that we're getting ready to celebrate this next couple days. It's the same time of year. And we must remember that the number one thing we all must fight today is doubt. Amen. The reason this particular rabbi, I wish I could have, I would have written down his name to give him credit. Because it's important. It's, it, I didn't come up with it at all. But this particular rabbi said that the customs with a lot of the teaching during this time of year always mentions Amalek just previous to the Purim season. Because we must remember that the reason Haman, Haman, is so important that we, every time his name is said, all the kids will, they got clickers and noisemakers and all kinds of stuff, and make all, it's to blot out the very name of, a, of Amalek. And what it's trying to show is, the only reason doubt can come into the body of Yeshua Messiah is because we don't lift up a noise every time doubt tries to get in our ears. When doubt comes against us, you need to lift up the noise. No, no, this is what the word of the Lord says. Yes. Amen. Amen. When the devil comes against AYZ congregation, you need to stand up and say, No, devil, this is what the word of the Lord was to rabbi. This is what we're going to do. That their property out there that the, that the congregation already has, it is going to be a place for broken people to be fixed. For people to have a transitional place on their journey. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yeah. It's going to be a sanctuary. I sat with uh, Sister Deborah the other day during, during the fast and prayer time in the morning. And she said she started seeing God with these brilliant see-through green bricks making this lighthouse. Have any of you heard her say that? You were, you were there with us. Multicolored. But green was some of it, wasn't it? Some of it. Maybe not. Green was, yeah. Anyway, she said she saw a tower, a lighthouse. Amen. On that property. But what was the other significance of that? It was something more, wasn't it? It was actually like drawing in the light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cannon, that's the word. Yeah, cannon. There was actually going to be a can. There was going to be a cannon to shoot out light into this entire region. Now, come on now. If all we do is sit on the pew and say, well, we went to another Shabbat, and we, you know, we had a good time, and yeah, it was good, and... I hope Rabbi Michael's back, Lex. If that's all we continue doing, guess what's going to happen in the wilderness, in the desert? You're going to stay. But in the words of Isaiah the prophet, make straight the ways in the desert. While we are currently in this facility, bolster our faith for the new season. It's time there's a new beginning coming. But if we don't stand up now, 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 says the Lord, we must stand up now and start bolstering our faith for the word of the Lord, for this congregation, and what God's plans are for that property. We must do it now. Yes. Now that doesn't mean that we go out and we start doing things foolishly without God leading us in timing. But it does mean that we make loud noise and clack 
when we hear the name Amalek, which to us is going to mean doubt. doubt. When doubt tries to creep in your spirit because of what's going on, Rabbi told me the other day, he says, you know, this is not the time for Deborah to go home. There's too much stuff to go on. And that man of God bolstered up his faith and the faith in his wife. And I'm telling you, she wonderfully made it through time of surgery. And the only reason she's not home now is because her physical body was reacting to being worked on. Basically is what it is. Amen? And I tell you, it's time for all of us to bolster our faith. It's not time to quit now. Life Connections ain't quitting now. AYZ isn't quitting now. As a matter of fact, we've got to come together as the body. And we need to start raising up just exactly what his mom saw. This light cannon. And all of us play a part. All of us have an arm to hold up. Stretch out your arm if you would and let your neighbor hold it. Hold it up. Somebody, if you can, just somebody around you. Amen. Think about it. If all of us were willing to cross the barriers, <laughs> well, we whites don't do that because they're black. We Mexicans don't do that because they're orange. We purple don't do that because they're red. We Baptists don't do this because they're Pentecostal. We Pentecostals don't do that because they're Jewish. Forget that mess. Amen. When are we going to grab hand to hand? Yes. Amen. And blot out the name of Amalek forever. Yes. Blot out doubt in our hearts so that we can stand firm on the rock. And allow God to use us as vessels, just like He did Moshe, to proclaim the word of the Lord in this area. Amen? Do you receive it? Yes. Do you want it? Yes. Amen. 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 I believe I was sent today to tell you new beginnings are coming, but let's blot out the name doubt. Yes. Let's get rid of it. Yes. Amen. Amen? Just as we see Yeshua showed up as the new wine, mm. we already had the good, let's transition into the best. Let's move into the righteousness that's only through Him. Let's move in on our concepts and our heart. And let's take away the weeds and all the, all the jazz. And let's really get it straight with Him. Amen? Now, like Nathaniel preached last week, that doesn't mean that you take one step and you're there. Blameless at every level. Every entrance of His Word and you correct it is blamelessness. It doesn't matter that we don't know everything. It matters that we're doing what we currently know. And then when God takes us to the next level, we do that. And the next level, we do that. That's what, that's what it means. Amen. I'm going to give it over to Nathaniel because I'm done. No, you stay up here. <laughs> you got to preach on the new wineskins. Yeah. <laughs> next time. Amen. <laughs> okay. Moving on to the next level, the bridge. Anyone remember that? This is awesome. I mean, it really is. Because it goes right along with what was said before. But I would like to say one thing real quick about the, the joining hands. And this is to young people. I think young people hear those, but this is out to you two. Understand that the generation before us is Moshe, and we are Yehoshua. If we're going to succeed, they have to succeed. Amen. Come on. If we're going to succeed, we have to pay for them that they get the people that will hold them up. Come on. <laughs> or else we're going to die. Give the, Lord a the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Sar Shalom. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, 
our Lord, our righteousness, our salvation, the Prince of Peace. Amen.